Thank you. I would like to talk a little bit about lust and why it's such an important and powerful emotion. And I'd like to start with the Ten Commandments. And it's really fascinating, and I'd like you to consider this point, that two of the Ten Commandments deal with lust. First, thou shalt not commit adultery, uh, but also thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Now they also added thy neighbor's lamb, thy neighbor's ass, and a bunch of other things that the neighbor had. But it's fascinating. Why did they, uh, the founders, why did the people who wrote these Ten Commandments believe that it was important to include two to cover their bases? And what I'd like to argue uh, today is that they had a very ingenious insight. And that insight was that coveting, the psychological state of desire and lust, in fact leads to deeds, leads to actual behavior. Now not always, of course. President Jimmy Carter was famous for noting in a Playboy interview that he had lust in his heart and had committed adultery in his heart many times. But as far as we know, he had never actually committed adultery. And so people experience lust, but they don't always act on their lust. But nonetheless, the founders recognized that this act of lust, the act of coveting, in fact, does lead to deeds. Now, one interesting issue is from an evolutionary perspective, why men has, have lust is fairly easily understandable, and that is sperm are cheap, eggs are expensive. Males produce millions of sperm every day. Women have a finite number, a small number of eggs during which they ovulate maybe at most a couple of hundred during their lifetimes. Another way of saying that is that men are the less valuable sex, they're easily expendable, and women are the more valuable sex. But this selection pressure has created in the human brain, in the human mind, psychological states that we can capture now in the psychological laboratory. Uh, for example, how many partners would you like to have over the next 10 years? If I am the king of the universe and I give you your magic wish, Tell me how many sex partners you would like to have. Well, you don't have to tell me because we know the answer. Women, on average, want eight-tenths of a sex partner in the next few months, uh, gradually escalating to a full sex partner and then leveling off at four to five in their lifespan. Men said two in the next month, eight in the next couple years, and 18 in their lifespan. This was after deleting three men who said they were like a thousand women. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> I skip one here. Uh, male sexual overperception bias. Okay, we make inferences about what's going on in other people's minds and inferences about their sexual states. And one of the fascinating things is this male sexual overperception. So the classic case is a woman smiles at a man and the man thinks, oh, she wants me. She wants my body. She's interested in me. And women say, no, I was just being friendly. I was just being polite. Uh, and, but men have this sexual overperception bias, and it is especially intense with respect to women who are viewed as attractive. Uh, men also have a variety of other psychological states that shift, for example, the closing time effect. Do girls get prettier near closing time? It turns out that they do. And you might think, well, maybe that's because they've been dr drinking a lot. And it turns out there is a beer goggles phenomenon. But there is a closing time phenomenon above and beyond the beer goggles, such that women, in fact, do literally become more physically attractive near closing time as, they, as the opportunity for capitalizing on their sexual interest uh, starts to close. Now, uh, there are other studies of men consenting to sex with strangers, so they do studies where they walk up to women and men on a college campus, and they just walk right up to them and say, hi, I've been noticing you're on campus lately. I find you very attractive. Would you have sex with me? A weird question. Granted, 75% of the men say yes, 0% of the women say yes. Of the 25% of the men who say no, many are apologetic about it, citing a girlfriend, a fiance, 
or parents in town and asking for a phone number and a rain check. So very different psychological states when it comes to lust. Now, lust in fact affects men's actual judgment. So there have been experimental studies where you just say, okay, here's a woman and they give a profile of a woman and they say uh, she has had sex with 50 different partners and not, have ne has never used a condom. What is the probability that she has a sexually transmitted disease? And men say, well, pretty good probability. But if you put a photograph of an attractive woman in that same, and ask them exactly the same question, they say, oh no, she doesn't have a sexually transmitted disease. It affects their actual judgment. Uh, and it also affects their decision making in a very uh, brutal uh, way. When you think, would you enjoy having sex with someone you hated? Men in a, cycle, in a, in a sexually aroused state, 70% of them would say yes. Only 53% of men in a non aroused state say they would have sex with a woman that they hated. Uh, so there are these psychological biases. Now I've been talking about men's lust. I want to shift to women's lust because in fact women experience lust and men are terrified of it. Uh, and I can prove this to you by asking the women in this room, which guy do you find the most attractive? If you had to pick one, which do you find the most sexually attractive? And I ask the guys in this audience, which guy would you be most upset with if you found out that this guy became best friends with your wife or girlfriend? Which one would you pick? It turns out for women, it depends on whether they're ovulating. Women who are ovulating prefer more masculine if they're not taking hormonal contraceptives or the pill. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to skip that. Now, men are afraid of women's lust, and this shows uh, has, has been manifest throughout history, going back to uh, Odysseus, where he had his, uh, his mates lash him to the mast in order not to succumb to the call of the siren women. Okay, why do they do that? Men have seen, men have coined terms like nymphomania to try to pathologize female lust. Uh, male sexual jealousy, driven by female desires for other men. Uh, men try to control women's lust throughout history through veiling, cloistering, putting women in harems guarded by eunuchs, genital mutilation to eliminate female sexual pleasure, guarding their daughters, and of course, intimate partner violence. Now, there are all kinds of costs of lust, and I don't want to minimize the costs of lust. Uh, sexually transmitted disease, reputational damage, as we know, uh, they promote, they motivate people into infidelity, uh, and so we know, at least based on American studies, North American studies, that something like 40 to 50 percent of men and something like 25 to 30 percent of women do have uh, do commit infidelity at some point during the course of their marriage. There's violence from jealous mates. Men go berserk when they imagine their partner having sex with another man. Uh, now, I want to show you even something even more dangerous, and this relates to an earlier talk that we heard uh, this morning. Uh, and that is that uh, the leaders of terrorist groups sometimes exploit male lust to recruit young males who have no sexual access themselves. If you live, if you live, in, a, live in a polygynous culture, if for every man who has three, uh, four wives, there are three men who have zero wives. But if you promise women in the afterlife, that seems to be an effective recruitment tool. We need to know about this. This is not new, though. This goes back to ancient times. This is Genghis Khan, the feared Mongol warrior, who noted that the greatest pleasure is to vanquish your enemies, to chase them before you to rob them of their wealth, to see their near and dear bathed in tears, to ride their horses, and importantly, sleep on the bellies of their wives and daughters. So this is a very ancient uh, motivation for warfare. Now, how can we change the world for the 22nd century? We have to recognize that lust is a sword that cuts, cuts both ways. So uh, here's something, a, 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 uh, the Greek tycoon extremely wealthy, Aristotle Onassis, Onassis said, if women didn't exist, all the money in the world would have no meaning. And in fact, much economic productivity is produced by lust. It is not chance, for example, that the two most lucrative 
internet businesses are pornography and internet dating. There are all kinds of benefits associated with lust. Why do you think people, men, have created poetry and art and music and culture? If you act on your lust and actually have sex, having frequent sex is shown to be linked with a healthy heart, a boost in self-esteem, healthy production of hormones, and it makes you even look and feel younger. So there are lots of benefits of acting on your lust. And of course, from an evolutionary perspective, Lust provides the sexual motivation for pair bonding, which is very unusual in, our, uh, in mammalian species. We form long-term committed relationships, and then, of course, for reproduction. One way of saying that is, uh, to paraphrase the Doobie Brothers song, who said, without love, where would you be? Now, I would say, without lust, where would we be? Everyone in this room, including me, we are all the descendants of a long and unbroken line of ancestors, all of whom experienced lust and some of them combine that lust with love to produce us and we are here by virtue of their lust so the universe of lust is various and complex it ranges from beneficial to horrible and and terrorism and warfare but we need to have a deep understanding of lust if we're going to control it and this gets back to something elizabeth gilbert said and to echo her comment, that curi and this is a phrase from Thomas Hobbes, curiosity is the lust of the mind. And I think that this conference, La Ciudad de las Ideas, it, it, it embodies this curiosity, the lust of the mind. Only by a deep understanding of this duality of lust, its benefits as well as its horrors, can we hope to change the world in the 22nd century. Muchas gracias. Thank you. <clears throat> Just one very quickly question. Yeah. You wrote a book named Why Women Have Sex. And of course, I will ask you why not, but well, that's not the question. <laughs> that's the follow up. That's the <laughs> follow up question. And there you mentioned um, that there are like 237 mm. reasons or something like that that women have sex. Yes. How many reasons do men have? to have sex? Well, actually, uh, some say just one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is, uh, men are simpler. Some, we, I wrote a whole book called uh, Why Women Have Sex. Someone commented that if we were to write the same book about men, it wouldn't even make up for a pamphlet. Uh, but I think, that that's, I think that's an underestimation of the complexity of male sexual psychology. I think, in fact, male sexual psychology is a lot more complicated than we give it credit for. I agree. Very quickly, you look younger and healthier. I don't know what you have been doing lately, <laughs> but congratulations. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.